Cults have been around probably as long as humans have socialized in groups. It went by excessive devotion in the 19th century, but the basis is the same. However, somewhat quirky or innocent religious or spiritual groups are just the tip of the iceberg, and currently we have many sects of society that would be considered a cult if we go by the standard definition. These sects have far-reaching powers due to the advent of social media and the internet. The largest and most recent cult we have experienced is what I like to call the Branch Covidians. And yes, I said Covidian. Of course, this in itself is a controversial opinion. I challenge you to get out your mirror for self-reflection and get out your shovel for digging and let's find out why Branch Covidians meet the definition of a cult. A cult is compromised of members and supporters who are not fully aware of the extent to which they have been exploited. A cult is characterized by an excessively zealous and unquestioning commitment to a specific leader. A cult is preoccupied with bringing in new converts into its ranks and disparages those who remain on the outside. Cults discourage and even punish questions and dissent. They use mind-numbing techniques such as denunciation to suppress doubts. Cults dictate how members should think, act, and feel. Adherents must get permission and direction on how to engage in daily life. Matters as mundane as what to wear, where to shop, and when to work are subject to leadership approval. Cultists are elitists, claiming an exalted status for themselves and their leaders. They claim to have a special mission to save humanity. They have a polarized us-versus-them mentality, which causes conflict with the broader society. Cult leaders refuse to be held accountable. Instead, they teach that their ends justify their means and promote values and behaviors that even they would have considered unethical before joining the group. Cult uses guilt as a means of control. The subservience of cult members to the group and its leader causes them to cut ties with family and friends. Cult members are encouraged or required to socialize only with other group members. So that was a summary from an article I found, and it has a lot of criteria buried in there. Some of them overlap. So what I'm trying to do here in this video is we're going to break it down um, to the main components, and we're going to talk about how that applies to the COVID zealots or the branch COVIDians, as I like to call them. So the first thing is excessively zealous and unquestioning commitment to a specific leader. In this case, our specific leader was more than one person. However, it started with one. Lord Anthony Fauci. His name is Fauci. That's just a play on the name. Patron saint of epidemiology. He became a, the cult hero and his fucked up policies gathered massive unquestioning support and commitment to the science. Trademark. Just look at how anyone who dared question the science was publicly mocked, and in many cases they lost friends, family, and employment. There were reports that in private Fauci was mocking the American people who were following his fucked up advice. Yet, you were called a filthy anti-vaxxing conspiracy theorist if you dared to use your critical thinking skills and ask any questions because the shit just didn't seem right. Surprisingly enough, it was much worse in Canada. Dr. Teresa Tam and her provincial counterparts were held up as false gods, and every response to his dissenting question was to be met with, Don't you trust the science, bro? Despite all the unwavering support and methodical compliance the brainwashed public gave, the so-called experts lived their life as they always had, getting caught maskless in public occasions, having gatherings above the safe number, and traveling out of the country as if the same rules they forced upon the public did not apply to them. In a cult, the leader is the ultimate authority. If you're not allowed to criticize your leader, even if the criticism is true, you're probably in a cult. Cults begin with a charismatic leader who claims some supreme knowledge. They may call themselves a prophet, messiah, messenger, or an enlightened teacher. They can also be CEOs, military officials, politicians, and self-help gurus. Cult leaders convince members to forfeit their critical thinking ability in return for a sense of belonging, authority, and purpose. To members, it doesn't matter what the evidence or logic may suggest. The leader is always right, and their misdeeds are always justified. Criticism of the leader is forbidden. Punishes questions, doubts, and dissent. There are so many examples of this, and they were touched on previously, but the biggest on 
this is the campaign against misinformation, otherwise known as censorship. Doctors who have studied viruses and vaccines their whole career had their social media accounts terminated, lost jobs, and were quite often reprimanded by the governing body. What makes one doctor with the same credentials an uh, expert over the other? Well, willingness to toe the narrative, it seems. One of my first questions when all these draconian rules came down and took away my personal autonomy was, where is the evidence this will work? And I was screamed down and ridiculed by former friends, family, and my workplace. I personally love memes. Um, they're kind of the mindless entertainment that I can always get a chuckle from, even on like my worst days. So I dared to share a face diaper meme, or it was a meme about uh, comparing the mask to a face diaper. On my personal Twitter, and it was for pure entertainment. The fallout that happened has probably tarnished my faith in humanity forever. Numerous uh, Twitter Karens researched all my details, were able to locate my places of employment, which happened to be in a healthcare capacity. They bombarded my boss with complaints of my competency and demands that I be fired, all for sharing a joke that was not even remotely offensive. Another example is when my teenager had a nervous breakdown during the summer of 2021. He had not been vaccinated for reasons that are private, and his regular GP was on vacation. So during this time, um, he thought that he was having a lot of physical issues um, that were obviously related to the anxiety, but trying to calm down a 17-year-old when they think that they're dying is not easy. So I tried to get him into a walk-in clinic so that they could do his vitals and, and reassure him. And before even telling them what the issue was over the phone, they asked his VAC status. And when they were told that he had not been vaxxed yet, they flat out refused to see him. This sent him into a deeper spiral of hopelessness as he had no idea what was wrong with him. He never had any mental health issues before. After a visit from paramedics, fire department, a failed ER visit, and a consult over the phone with a therapist, many, many sleepless nights where my child was crying in my bed with me because they were suffering so much. I was able to get him in to see his primary, who was absolutely amazing, but that was two weeks after the incident started. So, again, you punish, they punish the dissent or the questions or, or doubt. The group suppresses skepticism. If you're only allowed to study your organization through approved sources, you're probably in a cult. Cult views critical thinking as an infectious disease, and every effort is made to suppress it. Doubting members are encouraged to isolate themselves from outside influences and focus solely on the doctrine of the cult. Criticism is forbidden. People who contradict the group are viewed as persecutors and are often given labels as anti, apostate, or suppressive person. Members are discouraged from consuming any material that is critical of the group. This is probably, will remind you of Scientology. Disparages those on the outside. This, again, was kind of touched on in the point above, but we can use the example of the vaccine mandates for this. In Canada, you were not allowed to leave the country if you were not fully vaxxed. And of course, technicality or, you know, people that work with technicalities are going to come and say that's not true. No, it's not totally true. But of course, if you did want to leave the country, you just had to drive. So your only option to go anywhere was to the U.S., which in some cases is not feasible for some people. From Canada, you can only drive to the U.S., like I said, so by restricting the air and rail travel to unvaxxed citizens, they were labeling them as outsiders and spread whatever kind of hate and vitriol a former drama teacher could come up with to achieve this. Attempts to induce guilt feelings in members in order to control them is one of the big things. Um, the group relies on shame cycles. If you need your group in order to feel worthy, loved, or sufficient, again, you're probably in a cult. Cult leaders trap members in shame cycles by imposing abnormally strict codes of conduct, usually prescriptions about diet, appearance, sex, relationships, and media, guilting members for their shortcomings. We saw this when people didn't want to wear a mask or when people didn't want to be vaccinated or when people stood less or closer than six feet from each other. And then they position themselves as a unique remedy to the feelings of guilt which they themselves created. Cult members are made to believe they are insufficient or unworthy on their own, and that 
The only way to become worthy is to confess their shortcomings to the group or leader. The leader then becomes the mediator of worthiness and the foundation of the member's self-esteem. Leaders who can make followers feel bad about anything can use shame to manipulate followers into doing anything, even if it's against their own self-interest or better judgment. One of the quotes I live by, I guess is one of my personal um, creeds, is if you stand for nothing, you fall for everything. And that's exactly what happened um, in the last three years. People tend to project because they have a trait or a desire that is too difficult to acknowledge. Rather than confronting it, they cast it onto someone else. This function this functions to preserve their self-esteem, making difficult emotions more tolerable. It's easier to attack or witness wrongdoing in another person than confront the possibility in one's own behavior. How a person acts toward the target of projection might reflect how they feel about themselves. And that was a quote taken from Psychology Today in 2022. Dictates how members should think, act, and feel. I am going to insert some TikToks here of a hardcore Branch Covidian who, still in this year of 2023, is spreading her virtue by informing the public how they should act and feel. Okay, so first of all, your life doesn't have to put other people's lives or your own at risk. Is your entire life eating out? Is your entire life not wearing a mask? Because there's ways to do things that are safer or safely. It's not like atrocious to ask people to do that. And it's not not living life. And the second thing is, it is so blatantly obvious what y'all think about disabled and immunocompromised folks when you talk like this. Because how is it not living life? Are we not living, breathing, having fun, accomplishing things? We just don't want our death or someone else's death or disability on our conscience. Stating that if you still don't follow the 2020 guidelines, you want to kill all of humanity. Despite the evidence that shows otherwise, many people who I know in my personal life who I thought were pretty intelligent people still fell for the propaganda and fell in lockstep with popular opinion on how we should act and feel. This is what people do when they're in a cult. Your feelings of subjugation when wearing a mask is selfish. You don't care about others is some of the things that would get thrown out to me. Not just me, but people like me. This is also represented in the obsession with masks. I'm reading a book currently um, that is, was, uh, I wish I could remember now, I'll link it, who was written by um, somebody who was saying, the, it's called The Cult of Masks. So it didn't matter if you had a reason for not being able to wear a mask, be it physical or psychological. It didn't matter if you were a four or five year old in your first year of school and just starting to read and socialize in larger groups, which by the way, requires body language and facial cues to master effectively. You must wear a mask. And that, these are quotes that I pulled from this book below. I'm gonna read some quotes. I'm gonna put them up on the screen. So these are from the book. Um, the face mask cult. It doesn't hurt to wear a mask. There are no downsides. So why don't you just do it just in case? So how the writer prefaced this is he, he put some of the common questions that people who did not want to wear a mask were asked by the mask, you know, people who are obsessed with them. And he's giving um, the response, the, the, I guess, scientific response because now that we know what we do a lot of studies have come out so the question the, this one question and like i said where i hold the quotes from is what i wanted to talk about is because it's very interesting the question is it doesn't hurt to wear a mask there are no downsides so why don't you just do it just in case the response to this is there are numerous ways in which wearing a mask has considerable downsides 
I cannot cover them all here, but here are a few. Note that the scientific studies on masks have mostly ignored mask harms. As a Cochrane meta-analysis of the literature states, harms were poorly measured and reported. Wearing a mask that covers your airways for long periods or even any period is a very unpleasant experience for many people. It makes breathing difficult, and the better the mask and the closer it fits to your face, the more difficult the breathing. It is very unhygienic, and for many people they feel, reasonably enough, degraded, dehumanized, humiliated, and defeated. Over history, forcing people to wear masks is something that is usually used as a punishment and or a sign of submission to reduce or remove their ability to engage in normal human communication and even to change or reduce their identity. This is also the obvious example of the Islamic tradition of masking women, which indicates their submission. Consider all the Scold's Bridal, a punishment mask, developed in Britain in the 16th century, designed to humiliate women who were considered shrews, gossips, gluttons, eavesdroppers, or liars. This practice spread to Europe. Such masks were known as Shanden Mask in Germany, which meant the mask of shame. And the mask, or sorry, the practice then spread to the New World with the Puritans. Given the aggressive and spiteful behavior of modern states in forcing masks on people against their wills, and despite the lack of evidence of benefit, it is entirely reasonable for people to feel that being forced to wear a mask is also, in this case, a sign of submission. For such wearing a mask is an unjustified intrusion upon their bodily workings, and every second they spend in a mask is intolerable. It is like being forced to wear special clothing by a victorious army of hostile invaders. In fact, it is even worse because you are having to cover your airways in doing so. In the Brownstone, Brownstone Institute article, Face Masks Are Not a Mere Inconvenience, author Aaron Hertzberg argues that masks may have many downsides that are not immediately obvious, and he articulates various categories such as the deprivation of personal autonomy, the sense of helplessness, the invalidation of your personal identity, the changing of your personality over time, the induction of a general feeling of being trapped in a nightmare, the stress of difficulty communicating, the distress of constant harassment, living in a constant state of worry, fear, and anger, the sapping of joy from many different activities, living in perpetual stress from social enforcers, public humiliation, the distress of being under the control of someone you loathe, making people doubt their sense of reality, destroying people's sense of trust and stability, dehumanization through forced anonymity, and more. Requires members to socialize only within the group at the risk of alienating family and friends. Has a polarized us versus them mentality. The government thought for some crazy reason they had the right to tell you who you can associate with in your own home and how many people you can have there. This created a huge polarizing effect and separated society into two factions, similar to the Hunger Games if you're up on modern uh, movies and, and books. The obedient virtue signaler and the filthy anti-vaxxer conspiracy theorists, so we have them on both sides. When using such labels and language, it is definitely polarizing. There were people being arrested for having guests in their home. I'm looking at you, Quebec and Ontario. In a normal society, this would be considered absurd and a huge attack on your freedom and rights. However, as groupthink goes, a group of people, largely spurned on by sensationalized media reporting, to reach a consensus without critical reasoning or evaluation of consequences or alternatives. It is the common desire to not upset the balance of the group or stand out. This is usually something that is prevalent in communist societies and high school. We all paid the price, whether you want to believe it or not. Tell people how to engage in their jobs or even what to wear. Forced working from home, forced Zoom meetings, masking, daily testing, forced vaccination, changes to the physical office environment, social distancing, plastic bags and sanitizers everywhere. People wanting outside the washroom, sorry, people waiting outside the washroom to make sure everyone was washing their hands. In my case, I was in a leadership position, so the constant fear the media was pushing out was really affecting my staff's mental health and eventually my own. Staff were constantly paranoid the masks wouldn't be good enough, requesting over-the-top PPE, afraid to speak to a colleague for fear of a droplet escaping their mouth. It was absolute fucking insanity. I was already miserable from having to wear a mask constantly, and it was exacerbating my claustrophobia and forcing me to relive some childhood trauma. 
I hid myself in my office to avoid having to put one on. Claims elite status for leaders and themselves. I think this is most represented at the Freedom Convoy. The Canadian Prime Minister purposely used polarizing and divisive language to promote his rhetoric and to let the good boys and girls know that him and his merry gang of inexperienced clowns should be the only people that are smart enough to be trusted. By January 2022, we had been in various states of lockdown for almost two years. Where the truckers' convoy took place in Ontario, they had been locked down the most in, I believe it was North America, but I, I have a feeling it might have even been larger than that. National debt was exploding, people couldn't work, businesses were failing. A group of hardworking Canadians decided to rise up and do what a marginalized group of people are want to do in today's society and bring about change. Along came the Freedom Convoy or the truckers' protest. Yes, this was a major inconvenience for the downtown Ottawa area. However, when people don't feel like they are being heard, they tend to use more drastic measures to get their point across. The ask prior to the protest was simple, to remove the vaccine mandate, specifically for truckers who were labeled heroes in 2020, for getting us everything we needed despite the world being in chaos. Now, they were being labeled as dirt under a shoe. They were being labeled as radicalists. They wanted to be able to keep their bodily autonomy and their jobs. Due to the Liberal government villainizing all of the truckers, it caused the Streisand effect and more and more people ended up being interested, all of who were labeled less than by their elite counterparts who were towing the line. When the Supreme Leader did not get his way, he threw a tantrum and took drastic measures never used during peacetime to silence the dissenters. Sorry, that's not true. It was used before peacetime uh, for the Quebec, um, I believe it was the Quebec riots, or, or actually I think a politician was murdered in Quebec and his father used it. But generally, the purpose of the Emergencies Act is to be used during wartime. They, to this day, are labeled right-wing fringe and have not just had criminal charges, but also had their bank accounts frozen. The truckers, the people who were involved in the truckers' protest, people who attended the truckers' protest. Freedom Convoy. The Emergencies Act was a matter of personal pride for JT. He appears to be a narcissist and would probably not be able to take the blow to his ego by taking the L. As all narcs do, he came down with heavy hands when humility could have likely had a more positive outcome. Never pray to false prophets. Cults thrive on conspiracy theories, catastrophic thinking, and persecution complexes. And the funny thing is that during COVID, they flipped this. They tried an Uno reverse here, and they tried to make it seem like the people who were questioning them were the conspiracy theorists. But in reality, by the definition, cults are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories and the persecution complex. In an effort to draw in more paying members, cults are often very aggressive in their recruitment efforts, which are usually justified as saving people from the evil world. Vaccine mandates, mask mandates. Anybody getting a connection here? Those who reject the cult's message are unelect, prideful, evil, or stupid. Honestly, I feel very strongly about this subject, and I could probably go on and on forever, but I mean, on YouTube, you are not really able to express your opinions yet. Um, maybe that'll change one day, but I think that I, I really, after reading the book, the Mask uh, Cult book, um, my experiences reading about cults and, and researching cults for not just for this video, but also just out of general interest. I really found so many parallels that I felt like I had to do a comparison. And the information I found, again, this is all my opinion, I found very interesting. And I just, like I said, I wanted to do a video and share it. You can l let me know what you think. I'm sure there's going to be many people who disagree with me. And that's totally cool. That's fine. I'm, you know, totally okay with that. Everybody has a right to their own opinion. But 
let me know, like I said, what you think. And um, if you think that there's any parallels to the Branch Covidians and staunch COVID supporters. <laughs>